is the Energy Makers Show, featuring energy industry leaders, domain experts, energy technology innovators, and public policy makers, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show, with your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, this is Paul Dickerson, and welcome to the Energy Makers Show. Today, we're visiting with John Hoffmeister, former president of Shell Oil, and current founder of Citizens for Affordable Energy. Following that, we'll visit with our good friend, Mark Livingston, partner at Hydric and Struggles, focused on executive recruiting for the energy space. All that right after this. This is the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Well, welcome to the Energy Makers Show. We have with us today uh, former president of Shell Oil and founder of Citizens for Affordable Energy, Mr. John Hoffmeister. John, great to have you on the show. Thank you, Paul. Nice to be here. Now, John, you you have a unique perspective, I think, on America's energy situation. Could you kind of, uh, to set the stage, walk us through where we are today? In the first instance, the U.S. built the world's most famous, most renowned, most robust energy system in the 20th century. It was fantastic. Imagine, everybody in the nation could get electricity wherever they chose to live. The liquid fuels program fueled an automotive, personal mobility, freedom revolution that just took care of everybody's personal needs through the 20th century. Somewhere in the late 20th century, we began to wake up to the fact that there was a price to be paid for all of this energy from an environmental standpoint. And we have, since then, pretty much atrophied the old system. In other words, we haven't replaced the old system with new. We've tended to shut down new initiatives, new projects in the name of environmental correctness. But what we haven't done is we haven't thought about the needs of the 21st century and begun to replace the old system with a new system. So what we have is frankly a constipated old system that's just getting older by the day with no plan to replace in the future that system with an alternative system. All of the talk that we have today about alternative energy is mostly talk, not action, because the alternative forms of energy are not robust. The technologies are not mature enough to make huge investments. Meanwhile, old just keeps getting older. The good news is we have plenty of energy resources. The bad news is the infrastructure is getting old and there's no plan to replace it. Well, and it sounds like it's not only getting old, but it's getting more expensive. And uh, so, so any group that says Citizens for Affordable Energy, I'm assuming finding members has, has not been a problem. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your, your role there in that group? During my tenure at Shell, when I spent a lot of time testifying in front of Congress in the face of ever-escalating gasoline prices, I just really found that the American people are deeply, deeply concerned. I went out to 50 some odd cities with about 250 fellow colleagues to talk to people at the street level about their concerns for the future, about the price of energy. America can't stand expensive energy. And the elitists, and there are certain elected officials who think that we just have to have higher priced energy. Well, there's an economic cost for higher priced energy. It's called recession. And we can't afford, people don't have the disposable income to pay high prices for energy. So I started Citizens for Affordable Energy for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to educate general Americans across the board, grassroots, focused on really the facts about energy. Not the politics, the facts about energy about supply, about demand, about infrastructure, and about the environment. And we have many, many members now. It has not been hard to join Citizens for Affordable Energy. It doesn't cost anyone anything. They just have to sign up on the website. We don't take money from energy producers, so we're not limited in what we can say by people who fund us. We're funded only by consumers of energy, individuals as well as corporations, who are as interested in affordable energy as anyone else. And, and so we're going to continue to go down the education path for a foreseeable future until we get such a large membership that now we can turn our attention to political 
outcomes, and we will create a political arm of Citizens for Affordable Energy, but that's some years in the future. And when, when you speak of education of the public, is it uh, within the school system? How, how do you go about better educating the public? At this point, we're focused primarily on adults. All right. We don't have the funding to really put the materials together yet for school systems, but that's our aspiration. So it's grassroots engagement. We're announcing this summer an ambassadors program where individuals can become ambassadors of Citizens for Affordable Energy. We have no paid staff. It's all volunteer. And it's remarkable how people do want to volunteer and get engaged and get involved because they see it in their self-interest and they see it in the national interest to have affordable energy. The reason we can have affordable energy, and I have no qualms about that, is we have more supply of energy in this country than we will ever need. If you look at the coal, the uranium, the oil, the gas, all of the sources of alternative energy, wind, solar, geothermal, hydropower, we have more source of energy, more supply of energy. All we have to do is capture it. To capture it, though, we need a plan, and that's what we don't have. We don't have a plan. You hear today how the president and, and many members of Congress are coming out pretty hard on the big oil companies. Uh, you know, as, as a former leader of one of those organizations, uh, what, what's, what's your take? My first concern with the oil companies is the abysmal job they do of explaining their case to the American people. I railed against that while I was still at Shell. The fact that the industry does so little and when it does, it does so poorly a job of communicating to the American people that when it comes to being victimized uh, or harassed by political leaders, they reap what they sow. When the American people don't know what the oil companies do, don't know where the oil comes from, don't know how expensive it is to produce it, don't realize that oil is actually cheaper than bottled water, but the fact that the oil companies are silent, they live in corporate bunkers, with a few exceptions, uh, they're not going to be friends with anybody. The fact that they have politically donated primarily to one party means the other party is going to take advantage when they're in power of every situation to put the industry down, and that's what's happening. So the industry is being played like a political tennis ball back and forth across the net between one party to the next party. Right now, the White House ten is, is held by a party that the industry has not been very supportive of for its own reasons over the years and it's being retaliated against. And that is to the regret of the American consumer, by the way. We are not drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, which means the future of domestic oil production is going down, not up, at a time when global demand is going up, not down. And so we're going to be faced with chronic high prices. I submit we will even be faced with liquid fuel shortages within the next three to four years because of the polarization that has taken place in Washington with respect to the treatment of oil companies. And by the way, utility companies are facing the same threat from this administration as oil companies. And so the American people are going to pay the price for the power gains of a certain political class that are trying to you know, do what they do with energy, but they don't have a plan, and they don't really know what they're doing. That's the problem. Well, and help me understand the mentality of, of, of the oil companies and the executives not better educating the public. I mean, they, they can hire PR firms uh, just as well as, uh, as some other group could. Why aren't they better engaging and spreading that message? There's been a long history to not engaging. Let's be clear, the industry always faces every day, 24-7, high degree of risk. And if you have put yourself out there as a so-called good guy, and then suddenly you have a refinery fire and people may die, or you have a oil leak and the environment gets sullied or dirtied by an oil leak, suddenly you're no longer a good guy. So you look like you're a hypocrite, talking good news, talking what you're trying to do for the benefit of society, while meanwhile you're killing people or polluting the environment. So there is this conundrum, this, this dilemma of how to present yourself. My advice has always been just present the facts, including among the facts, this is a high-risk industry. But so is flying airplanes, a high-risk industry. So is anything driving a car on a highway is a high-risk industry endeavor. And, and so just put the risk out there along with the reward. The reward is mobility. 
economic lubrication. Uh, you know, we, the energy industry is the lubricant of the economy. Sure. And let's take advantage of that. And so putting the facts out there, the American people aren't stupid. They're smart enough to understand risk and reward, facts, technology, and so forth. But it's a lack of interest, a lack of effort. And if the leadership of the industry is unwilling to put itself out there, it will continue to get what it gets, which is vilification by politicians who don't like it, who can use the relationship they have with their constituents to pillory them every time that they choose to. Well, and it's certainly a subject that you understand well. I think most of our audience and many of our audience have, have already read your book, uh, Why Do We Hate uh, the big oil uh, companies, should we be expecting a sequel at some point? Well, there will be a paperback edition coming out in September Perfect. 2011, which will have a new chapter which gives my views of the BP oil disaster and its implications for future energy strategy and plans in the U.S., which is not good news, by the way. Uh, but in terms of a sequel, um, my next book is on leadership. I, I think that leadership is lacking across much of democratic society, not just the United States. It's lacking among, across much of corporate uh, life. So it's a focus on what leaders need to do and how to do better what needs to be done. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. We'd love it if you'd come back. It'd be an honor. This is the Energy Makers Show, heard on the radio nationwide and right here at theenergymakers.com. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to the Energy Maker Show. Today, we have a good friend, Mark Livingston, uh, with Hydric and Struggles, where he serves as a partner. Mark, good to have you on the show. Paul, good to see you. Now, Mark, you've got an incredible perspective as the staffer of so many of these energy companies. What, what is your view of the U.S. market uh, for energy? I, I think there's there've always been some fundamental things in energy. The fact that it's so fundamental to how people live, the fact that it's always been tied up into the politics of the day, the dynamism of the industry, and I think that is absolutely continuing today. You've seen enormous trends and changes just in the last couple of years. You've seen a, a huge shift in investment around the industry. So I, th I think it's funny. It's kind of the uh, things you know, stay the same by, by changing, right? And so uh, I think that's what we're seeing. We've seen quite a bit of that in the last uh, 12 to 24 months. Now tell me specifically about Hydric and Struggles and where, where you fit within the market of this executive recruiting and staffing. Sure. So Hydric and Struggles, uh, we have 74 offices around the world, about 1,500 employees. Uh, we are uh, a leadership advisory firm. We offer executive search as, as clearly a core part of our business model. We also do do quite a bit of leadership consulting work where we work with boards and executive teams on succession planning, right. uh, coaching, development plans. Uh, you know, clients have gotten away from where they're looking for a single transaction to find me executive XYZ, help me develop a plan for my organization to take me from point A to point B. Uh, and we're doing a lot more of that and have been, and, and we continue to see that as a growth area. Now, one of the reasons that, that I, I think Texas is going to play such a strong role in this new energy, this clean tech space, is because we have so much talent here. Is that accurate, inaccurate, and how, how's it played out? Completely accurate. I think an excellent example of that is a company that just went public in the recent past, Kior, a uh, biofuels company, uh, staffed up with a lot of folks from the process industry here in, in, in Texas and in, in Houston. Uh, companies had a very successful public offering. It's, it's a perfect example. Uh, Horizon Wind was one of the earliest success stories in all of the clean tech industry, started by the Zilka family, Michael Skelly and others. Uh, hugely successful, uh, went on to be acquired by a major European utility, EDP. Uh, again, another success story and got there because we had the experience in power development, power transmission. Those folks came from that world in many cases. Now, how has Texas done uh, as compared to other states uh, when it comes to uh, job creation and, and uh, re really uh, bringing uh, those jobs home? Yeah, I, I think there's several hubs for especially around what's happening in clean energy 
in energy, it's still, it's Houston. I mean, in the United States, you, you've got hubs in other places, and certainly the Marcella Shale in Pennsylvania and New York's done well, but uh, I saw a statistic the other day that 40% of all jobs that were created in the United States in the last year were in Texas, and, and there's a driver for that, and that's clearly the energy economy, and that's clean energy, but it's also traditional energy. The engineering and procurement construction firms, the oil and gas firms, the, the, the refiners, you name it, they're, they're all building businesses and growing. Well, and I've heard it's a good time to be either a process engineer or a mechanical engineer. Yeah, no, without a doubt. It's, it's interesting. If you think back, and we interview folks all the time, and they walk us through their life histories. And if you talk to someone who got a 1984 chemical engineering degree, they'll tell you about the great job offers they got in medical device sales yeah. because the oil and gas industry wasn't hiring back then. So the industry has a bow wave of retirements it's facing and a gap of about a decade right up through the mid-90s where it simply wasn't hiring. And so if you're a mid-career, you know, up in the middle management experienced person, you're in high demand. Or if you're even somebody coming out of school today, the demand is greater than the supply coming out of the universities. And, and so that's why I think you see a lot of companies sponsoring various programs with Texas A&M and others to, to increase the number of graduating technical engineers. Well, within the energy space, uh, uh, looking at the different pockets of technologies or, or uh, even geographic locations, where, where do you anticipate the growth occurring over the next 12 to 18 months? No, that's a great question. I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. Again, we've seen in the last 24 months some really interesting changes. If I had told you that, that Chenier was going to be applying for an export license for natural gas, LNG, uh, 24 to 36 months ago, you might have looked at me a little bit askance. Uh, but the shale and the growth of shale plays has caused something like that to now become a potentially viable business model. You've seen similar shifts in the renewables and, and traditional energy world. You've seen coal, because of the low price of natural gas, kind of fall to the wayside even more. And people thought that was going to be due to carbon legislation. And in fact, we didn't get carbon legislation. Right. But it's due to the, to the economics of putting in you know, scrubbers and other environmental compliance equipment. Most utilities see that it doesn't make economic sense. So it's going away, but for a different reason than we thought. And then on the clean tech side, wind was the story, you know, two years ago, sure. massive build out, the financial crisis cost them in terms of ability of financing and project financing, and then the price of natural gases has really hurt them. So instead it's solar now. Uh, the price of solar is coming down so quickly, uh, not just in the modules themselves, but in the balance of plant and systems costs, and people are getting smarter about how to install it and where it should be installed. And so that, that's a huge growth area. Every one of our clients sees solar as a very, very big growth area going forward. Well, when, when we come back, let's dig even more deeply into the clean tech space. Let's also uh, talk about your operations internationally. We'll be right back. This is the Energy Maker Show with Mark Livingston. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome back. We're visiting with Mark Livingston, partner at Hydric and Struggles International. Mark, when we left, we were talking a bit about uh, natural gas and the effect that that's had over uh, certainly the U.S. market. Uh, looking at renewables, uh, we, we saw wind continue, you know, for years has been driving uh, in a positive direction, solar uh, even more recently, yet they seem to have had, uh, or they seem to have been affected a bit by natural gas. Can you give us your view of uh, where, sure. where those markets plan to go? Sure, it's interesting. We, we hear uh, when we talk to our clients, and, and that's really the, the interesting thing, is the perspective we get from working with so many both early stage and, and larger corporations, we see a number of effects from the price of natural gas. First of all, you've obviously seen the wind and solar utility scale markets suffer. Uh, California's renewable energy standards are, are really the driver of why you still see so many announcements around solar and wind. They're mostly focused into that market. Uh, and, and so it, it, in the short run, it, it's not been a positive. It's clearly had a negative effect on renewables. The interesting question is mid to long term, what would that do? And, and I've heard a number of very, very bright people explain that as they see the market, it's interesting. If you look at low natural gas, which allows for low cost peaking, if low cost peaking can exist, then the intermittency problems of renewables may indeed not be as problematic, which could therefore cause renewables to gain, especially given the drop in, in price curves on solar, which could 
could get very competitive by sort of the mid, you know, teens of, of this decade. The other interesting thing is, let's not forget the price of oil. Price of oil is still very high, right? Historical gap to natural gas in terms of BTU value. Why have we seen so many third generation biofuels, biochemicals companies go public? I think exactly because of the price of oil. So it's interesting, we all talk about the low co cost of natural gas and its negative impact on the renewables business, but the very high price of petroleum and petrochemicals is a major boon to the biofuels and biochemicals companies. Well, let's talk about some of these IPOs. Uh, is it just within the biofuels community or where, where else do you see a, a, a drive forward uh, for IPOs? Sure. I, I think certainly in the, in the recent past, it's been primarily biofuels and biochemicals. Uh, many of these companies are looking in both directions. You know, if you look at an Amaris, if you look at a Givo, uh, their mo business models clearly look in both directions. In fact, Givo just announced at the Paris Air Show, you know, the ability to, to work with airlines to take, you know, their biobutanol and convert it into, into a jet. Uh, so that would be a, a real game changer, especially given the EU carbon regulations for airlines. Uh, but, but you've seen Silver Spring, the, the uh, smart grid company, file on S1. Uh, the smart grid guys were the sexy thing a year ago. Um, clearly, adoption rates have not been what everyone had thought they were going to be. Uh, ironically, the DOE programs may, may have done less for them, than, and they were very helpful for other sectors in clean tech. Uh, so, so you may see one or the other. Uh, come out, uh, but but many of them are going to strategics uh, versus coming public, especially on the smart grid side. You're seeing way more go to strategics. So what type of leadership, when when you're looking to staff up or you get requests from companies looking to, to make that next move, what, what type of leaders are they looking for? That's a great question. I think it has a lot to do with the stage of the company and the end market. Uh, it, it, one of the things I always talk about with clean tech companies is, and, and this has been Hydrogen Struggle's approach since the very beginning that we created an alternative renewable energy practice was, this is a multidisciplinary industry. If you think about a biofuels company, you may need to hire an exec on the technical side from a biotech background. On the marketing side, you, if you're a chemicals company, you might need a chemical salesperson. You might need a, a supplier refining background for, for that. But from a CEO perspective, you definitely need somebody who understands the process industry. That can come from a lot of different places. So, so it's interesting. You see this multifaceted talent. Clearly CFOs, though, in heavy demand who understand public markets and then boards of directors. Uh, you know, public company experience boards of directors or directors who can help these companies navigate what is still a very early stage industry, understand the industries, understand the markets, can help coach and, and provide counsel to executive management is, is a major source of demand. Tell me more some of the examples of how, uh, as you're staffing these companies up, about your transition of traditional energy uh, uh, folks or traditional chemical uh, background of uh, the incumbent industries into this new energy space? That's a great question. It's interesting. I think especially for a lot of the investors out of Silicon Valley who may have had a view of, of oil and gas as, as being a monolithic large company industry who may not have had the opportunity maybe to, to live in Houston and feel the entrepreneurial drive of this city, which once you've lived here, you wouldn't question in a moment. Uh, I think they've been pleasantly surprised, actually, as they meet uh, many of the executives, how entrepreneurial some of them are. Yeah. That's not true of all, obviously, but of many. Uh, and so I think that that's been an interesting trend we've seen when they first established many of these companies. This is definitely true of some of the earlier stage biofuel, biochemicals companies. They were putting technology executives in as CEOs ex software, ex hardware, who'd right. taken companies public, done all this stuff. Unfortunately, they just didn't have the, the technical and, and marketing and commercial skills around the industry to be successful. You've seen a generational change now, swapping all those folks out, bringing in the folks out of the oil and gas and chemicals worlds. And so that's, I think, an interesting success. The other thing we look for is there's intrapreneurship. Are you the person who went to Beijing in 1988 to open up the new market for, you know, Chevron. Right. Um, that's different maybe than being in Shanghai in 2011. Sure. Uh, slightly different situation, different circumstances. Lots of folks have done those trailblazing intrapreneurship roles, and, and we look for that as a, as, a, as a very good sign of the ability to be an entrepreneur. Well, let's, let's stick with the international. Tell me a little bit about Hydrix Reach. Sure. 
Uh, interestingly, uh, we're a publicly traded company, so this is public knowledge. Uh, last year, for the first time, our Asia Pacific business was larger than our European business. Uh, wow. So we are very large globally uh, and uh, continuing to grow rapidly, uh, particularly in Asia Pacific, China, India, Australia, uh, you know, Hong Kong, you, you name it. Uh, it's, uh, so for us as a practice, we are practice structured. So we have a global natural resources practice and we have folks who are in Beijing and Moscow and London and Australia and, and Houston and, and all the right places. And we all work on projects together because again, the nature of the business is that it's global. Right. Uh, and so that, that is reflective of our clients and their desires. Uh, and it's reflective of, of how we do things. Well, so so that we can give our viewers a better sense of some of those placements mm -hmm. uh, internationally. Can you give us a sense of maybe some of the Asian placements or, or others that you've worked on? Well, sure. I, I think an excellent example of a company that, that we're pretty proud to have been involved in is, is a well, formerly known as Solar Fund, and, and now it's it's been purchased a majority owned by a Korean company. Solar Fund had been backed by private equity money, Good Energies. Uh, we worked with our colleagues in, in China to effectively rebuild the complete upper management of the company uh, from a president and COO through to a CFO through to a head of the U.S. and a head of Europe. Uh, had four different search teams working on all those searches, uh, collaborated together on all of them, rebuilt the leadership of a Chinese solar company with a U.S. listing, ironically. Right. And, and the company turned around. Stock ended up doing very well. Company started doing better. Korean company, Strategic, got very interested in, in what they had to offer and, and took them over. Uh, so uh, I think that's a, an excellent example of the kind of things we do. I, I think the other thing we have is the advantage to see trends. Sure. And we can bring those trends here to help our, our U.S. clients see, for example, in Europe, we're seeing huge increases in offshore wind and demand for offshore wind. I think a lot of it tied to the unfortunate circumstances in Japan with Fukushima, the fact that the Germans have, have you know, announced the closure of their nuclear business. They need large-scale power sources. Offshore wind is still very expensive compared to other sources of renewables, but it is very large-scale. And I think that it's going to be a clear solution in the North Sea. Well, with, with offshore wind in Europe, uh, looking at Asia, which continues to invest in mm -hmm. new energy sources, what, what, what are some of the other industries that, where, where you're finding growth? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, the, the, the Chinese, I think, have, have clearly shown in solar that they are going to be players. I mean, if you look at the top solar companies by volume shipped, market capitalization, pick your pick your favorite measure, uh, the Chinese are, are clearly a dominant you know player and, and as a single country, the dominant player, more so than even the U.S. and, and Germany. Uh, so so that's, that's a clear winner. I think you're starting to see the onshore wind. Uh, you'll recall Goldwind's announcement sure. uh, here in the States of a project that created a, a little bit of a stir in Congress, a little bit of a concern of some of the PTC, the production tax tax right. credits going to a Chinese company, uh, but for a U.S. development and for U.S. energy. Uh, so they are coming on strong in the wind turbine world. Uh, you've heard Jeff Immelt talk about that and his concerns with that. So uh, I think that uh, that's interesting. Where they're still looking to us, I think, are a lot of the other kinds of technologies. If you look at, at some companies in the ca catalysis areas where they're using catalytic reactions to convert coal to chemicals or other right. things, uh, some of the U.S. and European companies still seem to be in leading positions. Tell me what you're seeing in Latin America. So Latin America is fascinating because, again, Brazil. So uh, there's lots of stuff going on in other countries in Latin America. We have offices across the region. Um, it's interesting because Colombia, of course, has become now a traditional energy powerhouse with their oil and gas business. Right. So our Colombian colleagues are, have been very busy uh, with the growth of Colombia as an oil and gas center. Uh, but Brazil, you know, both in traditional energy, of course, with all the pre-salt uh, excitement and, and all the investment associated with that, but of course, as a sugarcane source, uh, second to none is a soybean source, second to none. So for biodiesel out of soy, for all the things that can be done. In fact, I just saw yesterday the announcement of, I believe it was Dow and Mitsui, might have been Mitsubishi, uh, announcing a big joint venture in Brazil to take advantage of some, some assets they have down there in the sugarcane world to, to produce product. And, and I think that uh, those investments, Bungie, Shell, I mean, it goes on and on, right, BP, they've all announced major transactions. And I think that's going to continue. You'll continue to see multinationals investing down there. Well, Mark, it is always a pleasure. I, I enjoy hearing your trends and you're a great leader in this space. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for the invite. Well, this wraps this week's episode of The Energy Makers, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at TheEnergyMakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson, and we'll see you next week.